Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Are you ready for Passover? Today, Palm Sunday, is not a distant 2,000 year old memory, but remains in the church's omnibus living memory, the pivotal event preparing us for a new reality and deliverance. Jesus triumphantly enters Jerusalem for the singular purpose, our deliverance, and he enters following a three year ministry of seven signs, as recorded in the Gospel of St. John. First, the wedding in Cana, where he changes water to wine. The healing of a nobleman's son from a distance. The healing of a man paralyzed for 38 years. Feeding the 5,000 with the five loaves and two fish. Walking on water. Giving sight to a man born blind. And now his final son, Simeon, the raising of Lazarus. The pangs of death had overcome Lazarus, but after four days he is obedient to his friend Jesus, who shouts out, Lazarus. Come forth. And I can't help but wonder if this is the only time that God violates our free will. Lazarus had no choice. He's called out, and he now is only offering obedience. Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Such language obviously resounded with Jesus' followers. Didn't Moses some 1,300 years earlier say to the Pharaoh, let my people go so that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness? Exodus 5. So this theme of freedom and deliverance resounds with all of us, especially during these challenging times of forced confinement. Our yearning for meaning beyond this life is shared even by the Hollywood elite. A few years ago, actress Lindsay Loma announced she was exploring Islam. She says, she said, I am a very spiritual person and I'm really open to learning. We all believe in something, and at the end of the day, it all ties to a God or spiritual advisor. We too, as Orthodox Christians, believe in something, but St. Paul is clear about the object of our faith, referring to Hebrews 12. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great and loud witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. In his book, The Eucharist, Father Alexander Schmemann describes the difference between faith and religious feelings. He says, faith is always and above all a meeting with the other, conversion to the other, the reception of him as the way, the truth, and the life, love for him. Meanwhile, religious feelings, which in our day dominate in religion, is so distinct from faith because it lives and is nourished by itself, is subordinated to personal tastes, and emotional experiences, subjective and individual spiritual needs. So Lohan's worldview based on mere emotions are really only the first step on her and our spiritual journey. As Christians, we are open to learning. Our faith is reasonable, but it only comes alive when we respond to Lazarus and our friend Jesus who calls us out of sin, death, and darkness. He is much more than a spiritual advisor and offers us much more than a reenactment of that amazing entry into Jerusalem in fulfillment of ancient prophecy. So let us go beyond the external signs of popular piety and focus on the seven signs of the Sinia mentioned above. What motivated you come to, to, to church today, albeit virtually? Faith or feelings? If it's curiosity, that's fine. Many showed up that first Palm Sunday out of curiosity to see Lazarus, who had been dead four days, now was alive and well, keeping stride with Jesus as he entered Jerusalem. But what piques your curiosity on Palm Sunday this year? Because we are called to go beyond mere affirmation of any cultural identity. Ultimately, I would hope today provides that portal to enter Holy Week and to probe the mystery of our Lord's passion 
Lazarus processed that first Palm Sunday as a free man, free from the specter of sin and death. You and I share with Lazarus that same need for deliverance. The seventh and final sign is that pivotal journey, that pivotal point in our Lenten pilgrimage. So now there is no turning back. Right now, right here, we are literally facing a crisis. The choice is ours to listen to his voice to come out. The choice is ours if we want to be loosed and to be let go. So today, Palm Sunday, we celebrate our yearning for freedom as we spread before the Son of God all of our hopes, all of our aspirations for true fulfillment. We are here today to choose the narrow path Speaking of narrow paths, allow me to share once again my field trip, my first trip to Greece as a nine-year-old boy. My father, George, had organized a tour, and one member of the tour was quite elderly. He had gone back to Greece for the first time after 40 years working in America and raising a family, and he died. <coughs> my father was called to take his body to his village. And it was just a narrow footpath. And they used a donkey to transport the casket. And my dad was riding on the donkey, and he got off trying to walk the path. And one of the villagers said to him, I'll never, I'll never do that again. I'll just say, I'll test that for you. You see, it is my veal. George, get back on the donkey. He has four feet. You only have two. The donkey had his role in helping my father with an important task. But what about that donkey that carries Jesus into Jerusalem? Jesus' seven signs are behind him now. And the lonely donkey assumes an important role. No, there are no miracles recorded in John's Gospel after the raising of Lazarus. Nearly one half of John's entire Gospel is devoted to the last seven days of his life. Jesus' life. So instead of temporal miracles, Jesus now moves toward his own passion, and his submission even unto death becomes the one and only true miracle. He ascends a donkey one spring day, and a few days later ascends the cross and creates the perfect Passover, perfect bridge for us to find our way home. Jesus riding on that donkey reminds us that he came to tame not just the chosen people, the Jews, all of us. The donkey's coat represents the Gentiles, and Jesus sitting and resting on that coat shows our obedience to a new law. Not a law of endless prescriptions on how to live or even on how to please God. Jesus on that donkey forces us to look within and to discover his power, true power, power that derives only from love, suffering and love. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, God always allows himself to be edged out of the world and onto the cross. And that is the way, the only way, in which he can be with us and help us. Only a suffering God can help. And it is God's power, clothed in the suffering love that looks me in the eye, forgives my sin, allays my fears, overcomes my anger. It's a power that sets me free from anything dehumanizing Lazarus is raised, but he will soon die again. But the one who cannot die will offer himself and rise to us the eighth day, the new day, and will never grow old. So let us begin with anticipation of final, final ascent to Pascha, edging forward from unbelief to belief, from the human to the divine, from repentance to rejoicing. Jesus now enters Jerusalem. And without saying a word, proclaims who he is. His triumphal entry on the lowly donkey not only fulfills prophecy, but affirms the true meaning of power. That true power is perfected only in abject humility. His kenosis, his self emptying Today, the Son, the God-man who wields perfect power, is the long-awaited Messiah, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. He rides into Jerusalem, and now we are caught up in a unique experience of time, keros, a sort of suspended animation between belief and unbelief, 
between the moral and the immoral, between an emotional high and that joy that surpasses all understanding, between the eternal love of God and the futile pursuit of man-centered philosophies. Two thousand years ago, this loving God focused on all, focused all of his attention for three years, teaching and healing his own people. The anointed one of Israel has finally arrived, and one afternoon, he mounts a donkey and announces he is everyone's Messiah. From that very day, this new reality is seared eternally and internally into our, the church's anamnesi, our church's memory. But such a memory has no impact unless we give it meaningful expression as did St. Andrew of Crete in the 8th century. He says, so let us spread before his feet not garments of lifeless olive branches, which, which delight the eye for a few hours in the wither, but ourselves, clothed in his grace, or rather, clothed completely in him. We who have been baptized into Christ must ourselves be the garments that we spread before him. Let our souls take the mean, take the place of the welcoming branches as we join today in the children's holy song. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Clear, my sister.